Welcome to the Dev Ready Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better tech. Today, we're joined by Matt Wallach. He is from Excellus. Matt, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, Andrew. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Coming on board and um, all the way from the US and uh, early morning in Melbourne. So nice little early morning recording for us. You guys are living in the future from where I am on Thursday <laughs> afternoon. Yeah, correct. Yeah, we're on Friday morning. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit weird how that works, but yeah, it does somehow. So Matt, you're obviously uh, been involved around SaaS and uh, speak a lot on this topic, run your own podcast and uh, video content around this area, particularly in the selling space. Can we dig in to learn about yourself? Tell us a little bit about Matt and your background and how you got into SaaS in the first place and then ventured into more of the sales component of SaaS. Sure. Yeah. So I've been in SaaS for about 15 years. Uh, got into it. We started a product that we knew was going to take over. It was a physical therapy based software. We were a electronic medical record for physical therapists or physios, mm -hmm. as they say, outside of the US. And essentially we had a, a solution that would make their lives much, much easier. We were the first SaaS product in the space. And so this is back in the mid 2000s when People didn't totally know what, what SaaS essentially was. So essentially what we did was we were kind of the first ones and we had to educate the market on SaaS before we had to educate them on, on us. <laughs> it was definitely a new thing and people were curious as to, you know, is this something that I like having my information up on the, on the internet, on the web and the cloud, as they say. So there was definitely a, a hurdle to overcome. But uh, fortunately, we did overcome it. It took some years for us to figure out what we were doing. Essentially, it was myself who was responsible amongst our team to be able to do the marketing and sales. And I was a little cocky going in and thought I could handle it, but it was really tough early and didn't quite know what I was doing and tripped and fell quite a few times. Once I uh, finally figured it out, I created it as a process. And that process we call the perfect deal process. Once we instituted that, it made everything much, much smoother from a sales perspective. It made it so much simpler to be able to get people into our funnel, to be able to move them through and to close deals. Uh, so that company actually grew quite big and we eventually exited for a nice sum. Did it again and, and saw the same sort of situation happen. So now that I've done all of that and been through the SaaS grind a few times, now I'm a coach. I help other software founders not have to go through that early stage struggle that I lived through. So I make it really easy for them. I make it simple for them to understand exactly how to market and sell their SaaS products so that they can scale and they can skip those early stage struggles and get right to success much, much quicker. Yeah, brilliant. And it's good to hear from someone that's been through the experience and done it and also exited successfully. And that we had a chat the other day and I was quite um, impressed on your background. So let's dig in just a little bit more on that. Tell us a little bit about, it would have been very different back then. SaaS 15 years ago uh, wouldn't have been something that was uh, banded around too much, really. And being the first in the space is always a good thing, but also a challenge. The education that you would have done then compared to walking into markets now where you might have 20, 30, 50 competitors. How have you seen the shift in the landscape of SaaS along the journey as well? Well, it's kind of funny because back then there we you know we were one of thirty competitors in our space, but mm -hmm. like I said, we were the first SaaS product. Ah, so th there were plenty of products available for the the people in the market, but everything else was you know it was a server based solution and not something that you could get from the cloud. And so really, that was our initial push was trying to educate people that hey, this is the wave of the future. This is what. It should be. It makes it so much simpler. It makes it so much easier. And how is it different from now? Well, it's funny because it's really hard to find any new solution that is server-based, any new solution that is, isn't SaaS. So everything's completely flipped. Whereas we were the first one in the space. Now, everything in most spaces is cloud-based because of obviously the numerous advantages you have when you're in the cloud. So it has been quite funny watching that evolution happen. But it was definitely a lot of education that we had to put out in the early days to to make sure that people understood. Back then, what drew you to that model? What was the that the uh, light bulb moment that took you down that path, bringing SaaS to that space? Well, that model, I think you know, we saw early that that was something that really had to be. It was so much easier to develop. It's so much easier to for the end user to access the information, to stay ahead of the curve in terms of the the version, everybody on the same version. I mean, the, the benefits are numerous, but in terms of the education, it, it really was some effort. And 
in our marketing, in our sales, once they, they started to talk to us, we really had to get them understanding how important it was to be able to do this. And we had to get them to trust and to believe that everything was safe and secure. Part of the, the education around that was, hey, this is the same level of encryption as banks. And so all of the, the banks that are out there online, that's what we're doing here. And for most people, that, that was what they needed to hear. Okay, great. So you have excellent security. It looks like banks are doing this. Seems like this is what needs to happen. Now, some people would say, well, I don't do online banking. So <laughs> they, they, back then, some people didn't, you know, in the mid 2000s. And, and we had to kind of say, well, guess what? Even if you don't, your information is there. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whether you do it or not, it's still there. Yeah, brilliant. And I'll bring it to now. We're in a very different world and climate right now. And SAS, there's SAS everywhere. There's, as I mentioned before, 30, 50, hundreds of competitors in certain spaces. Obviously, sales and marketing is, is, is a key pivotal to any business. But in a market and a climate like this, where um, consumers are getting thrown SaaS products through X, Y, Z, and a number of different tools, and I think it's probably software overload, really, and information overload from uh, how many tools there are to do certain specific tasks in very niche sort of categories as well. How do you go through that little landmine with your clients? It's a great question, because what you mentioned right there, Andrew, I call software fatigue. A lot of people are just inundated with software tools. And if you go into any business, any industry, they have a whole stack. It's not just, hey, what are you using to help you? It's what's your stack? And, oh, we've got these 10, 12, 20 different tools that we're using. And so when somebody else approaches them and says, hey, use my tool and use this, use this, like we already have so many tools. And so this software fatigue is out there in the market. And it's really hard to get a foothold because everybody is so used to being pitched at for some new tool, some new technology that's going to save them so much time or save them so much money. And so it is quite a challenge, Andrew. Now, what we do is we really work on, let's break it down. Let's figure out exactly what that market is living in, what their challenges are, what their struggles are, what their goals are, what are they yearning towards? How do we really understand that person who is our ideal customer profile? And then how do we build product around that? How do we build our marketing messaging around that? How do we pitch to that in the sales process and design everything around that very foundational ICP? Yeah, interesting. So for its fatigue, I might pinch that one. I think that's a nice little way to coin that with what we're experiencing. But you mentioned something interesting there. So you're helping and coaching people in the SaaS space from the sales and marketing, but you also mentioned understanding client, understanding their, their current environment, what's happening in their space, and then designing products. So tell us a bit about that, because would you have clients coming to you with product or clients coming to you looking to how to uh, tackle into a, an organization or an industry? How do they generally approach you? Most, well, I get approached by a lot, but I don't take on clients until they have a product and are ready to start selling the product. So okay. a bit later stage than you guys would engage mm -hmm. with them. But we definitely do talk about how they can improve and get better in their product, in their marketing, in their sales, because, you know, it's critical to be able to understand your market, your customers, your potential customers. You've got to have those conversations. I was having a, uh, I have a podcast as well, Sastry in the Making, you guys know that. Yes. And I had Ashitosh Priyadarshi, who's the CEO of Sansama on my podcast. And he has built a company to be extremely profitable and, and doing very well revenue wise with just five people. <laughs> and one of the things I asked was, hey, how are you guys accomplishing this? How are you able to give them exactly what they need? He said, we as founders still have conversations with our market. We make sure that we make a priority to have those conversations, to really understand what they're going through and what they're needing so that we can develop around it, so that we can make sure that we're we're emphasizing that in our marketing, make sure that our sales process is aligned around that. And it was really, you know, uh, confirmational for me to hear that that's how it's done still in the real world. I think building a product is one thing, but in reality, you're building it to solve problems. So some of the some of the things we hear in our world is people just 
sit behind a corner or behind their desk, build a product for something they perceive could, could be correct for a market or something they know a little bit about, and then they get a little bit stuck because then, then they look to sell this thing, but they really have no domain expertise or knowledge on how to connect to the consumer. But if you pair it back, you need to really dig in at the consumer level, the customer level, and understand them because in the end, we're actually trying to help them solve some problems um, and add some value, and that's the reality of what we're doing in business, really. Yeah, we're building absolutely. it so it can be used and just building software are two different things. So Matt, let's um let's dig in. So sales, sales and marketing. Now you've talked to me a little bit about some of the key processes that you take clients through. Can we explain us a little bit about your methodology and what sales in, in the SaaS market might mean and how you generally structure it up? Sure. Well, when when people come to me, they're usually missing one or more, sometimes all of what I call the four pillars of scaling your SaaS company. Of course, if you're going to go through the effort of, like we said, learning a market, learning a problem and coming up with a solution, developing out that solution and going through that effort and cost that, that, that entails, you've got to have some sort of end goal. So most people, their end goal is they want to have a very profitable company, or they want to have a big exit, or they want to make a big impact. For any of those things, you need to scale. You need to be able to, it's not going to be just a life-size business where you and your wife are going to, you know, have a fun little time with this. This is almost always something that you want to scale and get to be one of those, you know, things you read about in Forbes and, and Inc. So it makes it something that is a goal that's pretty aligned amongst most software founders. Well, in order to scale, you have to do four things and not just one, not just two or three. You've got to do all four. Those four things are first, you need to attract. You need to make sure that you have your perfect ICP, as we talked about, those ideal customers. They need to be aware of you. They need to be interested in you. They need to understand what your product is and what it can do, at least as at a very base foundational level. So attract is the first pillar. Once you've attracted them, you've got the right people. Now you need to engage. So just attracting them is not good enough. You need to engage on some level. Different companies have different ideas of what their goal is for engagement. Some of them want you to go into a free trial. Some of them want you to talk to the sales team. Uh, some of them want you to experience the, the product through a sandbox. Whatever it is, you need to engage. And that's where a lot of software companies trip and fall because they spend a lot of money to generate these leads. A lot of leads come in. And then they don't know how to engage them, how to move them down the funnel and get them to those next stages. And so a lot fall out and they only get a few people who actually get engaged and start to move through the process. So you need to attract your best customers. You need to engage with them. And the third pillar is close. Once you have an opportunity, once you've gone through all of this effort to spend the money on the marketing, to attract them, you've gone through the process of building out engagement methods. Now you need to close the deal. And if those people are, are going to spend their time and put out 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour of time for you and your product, you've got them. You cannot let them go. And so we talk about how do you build an absolutely dynamic demo so that your demo, your sales calls are so powerful. And really what we focus on is emotion. How do you get it so emotionally powerful that people, instead of saying at the end of the demo, they don't say, oh, this was nice. I really appreciate it. Let's talk next week. They say things like, holy cow, where have you been my whole life? I cannot believe I've gone without this product for so long. We need to get started as soon as possible. And there are methods to do that, Andrew. And it's something that a lot of people don't know how to do, mm -hmm. but it's very, very important to do that. That's a reaction that every salesperson wants at the end of their uh, pitch, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's the third one. And now that we've got a tract, we're getting the best customers to us. We've got engaged. We're having conversations and close. We're closing the deal and generating revenue. Once you see that happening, and especially if you're an early stage, you're a founder and you're a top leader, you're doing that. Well, sometimes it's just because of your sheer effort and your will of being that founder that you're making it happen. And so the fourth pillar, that's scale. We need to repeat this. How can we make it so that it's not just the founder or the top leader doing it? How do we make it so that we can bring in the right people? 
We can have them become the sales team. We can have them understand the power of, of what they're doing and learn the right methods. And we can motivate them the right ways so that they can go out and do just as well or even better than the founding team. That's when you really achieve success. So the four pillars are attract, engage, close, and scale. And that's what I help my clients achieve. Brilliant. I love how you just shared four little steps to get to scale, which is what your outcome was. I like the way it sort of winds together in terms of scaling out the sales team, because in the end, yeah, generally businesses start off with two founders, three founders, whatever it might be. And you might have one or two people, luckily from a sales perspective, generally it's one, like you, you started out in your early days. I imagine you started as that one man show that was a sales and marketing, right? So, and then you look into how you scale it. So let's dig in a little bit on the attract side, because that I see as one of the most important points, but then, like you said, you need to engage them and close them too, and then get to scale. But if you're not attracting anybody to your product to, from a marketing perspective, where does that sort of stem from and how do you get step one? In Attract, it's, it can be very difficult and it can be very daunting for a lot of founders. They don't know exactly how to do it. They don't know what they're going to, to say or do they have to spend money to do it. And so I work with a lot of founders who are frustrated because they can't get anybody aware of their product. They had this product built. They had this idea. They got it built. And now they're kind of just left holding their hat, wondering if anybody's ever going to come to the website, if anybody's ever going to hear about them. Mm. And so one of the things that we, we do is first talk to the founders about belief, making sure that they can believe that this can happen is, a, is the first step. And then we put in some actual real ways of doing it, some tactics. And one of the things that I constantly preach about is, hey, you might find one marketing channel that starts working. Okay, You might find this thing, it starts working, it's great, it's getting you what you need. Don't stop because so many times I've seen it where somebody gets a marketing channel, it's working, it's working, it's working. They, they rely heavily on it. And then all of a sudden that goes away and stops working for whatever reason. That marketing channel goes away and now you have nothing. And so what we talk about is let's get a multifaceted approach. Let's make sure if we have that one, great. Let's add another channel. Let's add something else. Let's add something else. How can we get several different marketing channels, different lead generation streams so that if any one goes out, we're still okay. We still have the others and the company can continue to thrive. We can continue to get our pipeline filled so we can move people through the funnel and close deals. And that's really critical. I think it's important. Yeah. Cause we, we as um, owners and founders, we can get a little bit complacent with what's working. And when something's working, we sometimes uh, can get a little bit less creative and less thinking from perspective of what else could we be doing to push this and grow this and expand this? That's a really good point that you've raised there. If you do actually find something that works, um, keep evolving, keep iterating, because it is an iterative process and things will change. The market will change, competitors will come, customer situations will change, and some of those streams may not work anymore. So really good tip there. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely something that's helped a lot of my clients. And I love what you said, Andrew, that competitors will come. That is true more than ever in the SaaS world. You know, I saw a quote once that if you're a healthcare company and you grow at 20% annually, your mm -hmm. investors and your stockholders, they're going to be thrilled. If you're a tech company and you grow at 20% annually, you're going to be dead within yeah. a couple of years. It's not going to work. So <laughs> many. Work. Yeah, exactly. The barrier to entry is small. People are going to come up behind you and smash you. You have to do doubling and tripling every year until you get some sort of size to be able to make it. And then you get to a size where you can bring in the teams underneath you and, and scale from a sales perspective. In terms of the engagement side, now you mentioned, so attract is, is one of the somewhat I would consider some sort of engagement when you're attracting people with, it might be content play, it might be whatever it might be to educate them and attract them in and engage them into what you're doing. But what do you mean by engagement within the SaaS product itself? You mentioned a couple of things like getting a trial or what it might mean there. Is it more engaging them into the product and what it does for them and the benefits of it? Is that what you mean by that? Yeah. So it, when we talk about engage with most SaaS products, you're going to need to engage them in some way. Very little of the time you can get a lot of people have this dream of an automated process. Oh yeah. All we have to do is just get them to the site and then the site takes care of the rest. There's a great funnel and it takes them all the way and they buy. That's a nice unicorn that one. <laughs> That's what we're yeah. looking for. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds awesome, but in reality, that is so rare. Mm. And if it happens, it's only for the very low priced products. Uh -huh. So you're talking like $19 product. You might be able to do that. That's why the 
Asanas and Trellos and all that have that low product. You can do that and just go buy whatever you want to buy and you're good. But for products above 50 bucks or above 100 bucks, you're not going to be able to do that very often. And so you're going to need some sort of team to be able to handle that. Now, what we get into in our process is that a lot of times founders set up a free trial. Okay, sounds great. Once people see this product, it's a great product that we had built. And once they see it, it's they're going to love it, right? Most likely wrong. <laughs> How many times have you done a free trial and you get in and click a couple buttons and then you leave and you never go back to that product ever again? I think everyone's right. done that, right? So yeah, so you don't know what to do with it half the time. That's the other challenge. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Ed. Um, you sign up for a new product and you're just looking around, thinking, uh, "What do I do next?" And it, you can lose people. Yeah, that is a big issue. And that depends on also how like technologically competent you are too. Mm, it does. And so true. And different markets have different levels of technology in the buyers. Some buyers are extremely technical. If you're selling to IT experts, then they're going to be pretty technical. But many markets don't have mm -hmm. that level of expertise, but you guys both just voice something that we talk about in our program. I have a SaaS founders program where a group, we get together and we all share these, these challenges and collaborate. And one of the things that I constantly preach is that your free trial is not a closer. Your free trial is not a closer. Free trials are a lead generator. Mm. They do not close. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have a free trial, just understand that. And when you understand that, it makes it much easier to develop your process. If you have a free trial, great. That gets them in, but it's absolutely critical. As soon as they get in, that you pounce, that you jump on them and you do everything you can to get your team connected to them so that you can try and close them. Because if you just leave it, they're not going to close. Yes, you might get a two, three, four percent close rate on your trial, whatever it is. If you get eight, that's amazing. But still, it's eight percent. You should be getting a lot more than that. So pounce. You've got to be able to engage with them. And there are methods that we teach within our program that make it really, really simple to get that engagement really high. And then once you engage, like we mentioned in the close pillar, that's when you're able to close deals at 30, 40, 50% of the time. Where do you, on this point here, do you find that the human interaction is something that definitely helps the situation here? Because you mentioned there, two, three percent is a number or eight percent if you just work looking at a piece of software. Do you find that that human touch, how much can that increase the process? How much do people appreciate the support and people helping them through the process? What do you find in that space? Oh, it's, I mean, it's a complete game changer. If you have somebody talking to your customers and your prospects and actually understanding how to manage that sales process and you know the right tools. One of the things we teach within our, our process uh, is a, a process within it called the perfect deal process. And it explains exactly how you should handle a sales conversation. And it makes it really easy so you can just plug it in and boom, repeat, repeat, repeat. But to your point, if you're not having people do that, then you're just hoping that they understand the system. You're hoping that they get some sort of value out of it and then they decide to buy at some point later. Yes, we're sending them emails. Yes, you're trying to, to engage them. But a huge percentage, usually more than 95% of those people who enter a free trial never close unless you do things right. The other thing that we see is that you do get them into a demo and you've been successful. And you're able to connect with them and you demo and they get really excited and really emotional in the demo. You did a great job. And then you send them to a trial after the demo. That is a no-no. Don't please don't do that. Because just like you guys both said, sometimes you get into a trial and it's like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. And mm. how should I what's this? And I don't know what I'm gonna do here. Well, how does that experience? Let's look at that holistically because you just got them all emotional and they're caring about what they need to do and they love this product. They're like, yes, this got it, this has gotta happen. We gotta have it. Let's go into a trial. And when they do the trial, guess what? They're going to experience a real downer because they come off that emotion and into the actual product. Now they have to set things up and they have to upload their data and they've got to do that. Oh, God, it's if it now, right? <laughs> You've thrown yeah, them all yeah. into the deep end and it's a trial, but they still need to do exactly what they have to do to onboard. And that's the reality. If they're going to onboard, they've got to do exactly the same for trial to experience the whole thing. Exactly. And it's painful. And you don't want them coming off of that high. You want them in the high making actionable buying decisions. Mm -hmm. So you want them to buy at the point of the presentation, basically, in within the close, with the, with the person in front of them, making that decision. Is that where you're leaning to? Absolutely. Absolutely. So in terms of the structure of the sales process that you generally advise, on a closing perspective, so you've demoed, they're, they're, they're excited, they want to go ahead, 
your clothes, what do you get them into? Do you generally push them to, there's different models in sales, right? In SaaS, there's a month to month, there's a annualized uh, sort of payment. Where do you recommend people attempt to close their clients and assist from a cash flow perspective within the business? It's product by product on that one. Yeah, definitely okay. if you have a certain type of product and a certain market mm -hmm. and a certain price point, doing the annual thing is great. Other products have seen a lot of success with the monthly. Yep. My first product, we actually started annual mm -hmm. and it was a contract and all this and it, it felt you know, kind of stringy to the prospects uh -huh. and we weren't getting a big close rate. So what we said was, you know what? Let's get rid of this. No contract, month to month. You just pay as you go because we realized that people loved the product so much. Once they got in, once we trained them, we got them up to speed, they absolutely loved it and nobody left. And so we said, if nobody's leaving, then really what we have is just a barrier up front to getting them in. They're not signing up because of the annual contract, because of the annual payment. Why don't we just get them in? And once they get in, they're just going to stay forever. And so we actually stood tall with our monthly payment and it worked beautifully. And we were closing at over 60% because there was very little barrier to entry. One of my, my sayings that I constantly preach, I actually can't take credit for you it. You said over 60% 60, there, didn't you? Wow, that's huge mm -hmm. close rate. Yeah. Yeah, our team was averaging 63%. Yeah, brilliant. And that's uh, not heard of much in the SaaS space. <laughs> not when you put, no, it, put it's a definitely trial not, out there. Yeah. yeah, especially when you have 30 competitors. Yeah, but huge. It, it managed to work out pretty well because we had the right process, because we made sure that people followed the process to mm -hmm. a T. Brilliant. You're saying you're going to jump into something about your dad, but I just want to clarify that 60% because that was a big number. Continue. Thank you. Yeah, no. So yeah, my dad always had a saying and it's never make it hard to have someone hand you money. Never make it hard for somebody to hand you money. I mean, it sounds basic and obvious, but so many times people kind of forget this and they make it difficult and Oh yeah, you're ready to go. Great. I'm going to send over our 14 page agreement. I just need to have you notarize that put in your social security number as well. Make sure that everybody on your C level signs it and authorizes it and puts their thumbprint on. Come on. Like I, obviously I went overkill there, but we've got to make it super simple yes, for it. people to hand you money to get started. That's a good learning. I think for anyone listening, because we can sort of draw in and look at oh, how do we protect our revenues? Let's lock people in 12 month contracts and, it is a thinking that goes through everyone's mind. It's, yeah, it will be a longer term. That's less risk on us. But you've got to understand what the client's seeing from that. That's all the risk is being put onto the client. They have no guarantees once they jump into the platform. And you mentioned at the start, if you believe one in your product and your ability, then you would definitely probably want to lean towards that month to month if it's the right fit for the market that you're targeting. I think you just said that, Andrew, if it's the right fit. For some, that's a great fit. For others, I wouldn't recommend it. That's why when I work with clients, we actually look at their market and their industry, and actually I can make a, a recommendation. But you're right. If you believe in your product, make it so that they feel like you're taking on more risk. For example, my coaching services, everything has a 14-day, no questions asked, full guarantee. So if you get in, you start working with me, you start going through the program, and you realize this isn't what I need and this isn't helping and I'm not getting very much learning here and I don't like Matt's face anymore. Whatever it is, full guarantee, no questions asked. I'm fortunate that I've offered that to everybody and nobody's ever taken me up on it, but that's what we stand behind because we say, hey, when you come on board, we are going to give you our everything. We're going to make sure that you have our full support to get you where you want to go and we stand behind that with the guarantee. And that's a belief thing, right? You know that you're going to get the client to a result that they're looking for. And if someone does happen to fall out because it's not right for them, that's probably good for you because it might be not be the right customer and might not be the right values between customer and yourself. So I think that's important for everyone to think about. We sometimes can have fear of losing customers, but sometimes they're not right for us anyway. So I might be better off moving them on and uh, focusing on who wants to be a part of, for example, your program or your product. I totally agree. And that's, I think that's really well said is that sometimes people just don't want. Now, ideally, what I would want to see is really strong upfront discovery within the sales process to make sure that the person you're looking at, the person you're selling to actually is going to be a good fit mm -hmm. for your solution. And when you can do that, you're going to really mitigate that number. Now, you're never going to be at zero unless you sell to like one person a year. But if you're selling at scale, you're going to have some that get through and get in and get started that aren't great fits. So if they're not great fits, make it easy for them to transition out. I don't like these companies that, oh, it's going to take five months and you're going to have to pay us to export your data. And 
that's a nightmare. First of all, if you do that, I, I'm a big fan of customer friendly stuff. So if you do that, guess what? They're going to tell all their friends that, yeah, we, we did it and it sounded good. But then once we got in, it was horrible and we tried to leave and they wouldn't let us leave and they made it hard. How many people are going to want to sign up with you at that point? And I think that's a, that's a, that's a huge point there because if you um, make the – I've had those experiences on a SaaS product where you just can't get out. And it's like, oh, they want you to do this. They want you to jump through hoops. And it's mm -hmm. quite a bit of a challenge. And then you get frustrated. And if you – just the product doesn't fit. It's not for me. It's, it's not working. I'm not utilizing it to probably its potential. I want to move on. And that's okay. And I think that people need to be aware of letting those people go. It's a better experience than trying to hold on to them sometimes when they should be let go. Yeah, I'd agree. I think you can still – if some people just maybe – I think basically – triaging that and figuring out are they actually a good fit and they just don't know it still or are they truly not a good fit and once you understand that i mean we're getting into a lot of customer success type stuff here i think you can are, yes. uh, you know feel yeah it's fine and feel comfortable that yeah we don't we don't think they're right for us we're not right for them let's transition them out let's make it happen now getting into that close you've touched upon emotion quite a bit where do you draw on that um, what sort of language are you using and how do you um, Build out a, an emotional journey for the customer to get it attached to the product and the benefits that might help with them personally, professionally in a business. What are some of the key things that you you look to pinpoint in the emotional journey there? Well, the biggest part about getting them emotional, because everybody knows that, everybody's heard that. Like That's not something that you need some sales coach to tell you that you have to find emotion. The problem is how do you do it? And it's if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have the right framework, it can be very, very challenging. But you go in and you say, oh, we're going to make them emotional. We're going to show them this product. And they're going to say, this is amazing. And look at how this is so cool. And look at how many uh, amazing other customers that we have. And look at these testimonials that we have. And look at how awesome we are. Guess what? That's not the approach. That's not how they're going to get emotional. People get emotional about their own situation. They get emotional about themselves. We don't get emotional too much about other things. You want to be able to get into their world. When you're having a conversation with somebody, you have to understand them. You have to understand what they're yearning for, what their goals are, what they're having trouble with, where they're finding challenges. And when you can do that, you can start to get them really emotional and into a place where they're ready to take action to reach those goals or to solve their pain. But, and I, I'd second that. And one of the learnings that we've had in business, just putting out this little business hat on is we sit in more that solution selling space. So it's all about what the customer needs, desires, is looking for, striving for. And when you flip into a product, you still want to be doing that. And I think people get a little bit lost. Let's build a product and just sell it's what it does. You still need to understand the customer, what their situation is, like you said there, what their challenges are. And if your product doesn't need it, then move on. But if you can find some opportunity for your product to solve their problems, I think that makes more sense to me. Yeah, I totally agree. One of my clients, Greg, took this head on. So when he came to me, he was closing at about a 2.9% close rate, which is, is is very, very small. He was about to give up and go back. He said he was going to have to get a real job <laughs> and give away his amazing product that he developed. And so we really worked on discovery, really by figuring out how are we going to get his prospects very, very emotional, very at a high level of care for their own situation, realizing how bad their situation is and get them needing a solution. And once he learned the process and started to employ that, he's now closing it over 30%. And so he 10 X his close rate. And he says now that they are 90% closed after discovery. He never has shown their product. Yes. <laughs> he just works them up in discovery. Mm. They're basically ready to rock and roll. Yeah. So it's ve very much, Oh, wow. Yes, you're right. I am having problems. This is bad. I need a solution. I didn't realize how much I needed a solution, but I really do need a solution. Oh, you have a solution? Great. Let's go. Let's take it. I think that's what you said there, 90% closed in discovery and people get an understanding of what that actually means. They're selling themselves. They're, you're building awareness for them in their current situation, which you sort of tapped upon there. And there's nothing more beneficial that I find in a sales process is building awareness about the customer's current situation and helping them through that and getting understanding of where, how it could get better as well um, if they did something about it. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense about closing a discovery to me. I totally agree. I mean, it, you're right. They do kind of sell themselves and it's really important to get them to do that because they have to tell themselves that this is going to be the solution for them. But a lot of it is the way you structure your process, the way you build out your process so that they get to that point.
Now, the easy part would be scale if I uh, would be incorrect. So the guy that just went from 2% close rate to 30, and if he was doing it on his own, he now has a process from a scaling perspective that shouldn't be too difficult to implement other than find the right people that are passionate about the product and helping the customer. Add some more value to that, but that's my current thinking right now. You're right. Once you have a process, once you've developed this framework, that scale piece is so much easier. A lot of founders come to me when they've got the attract, they've got the engaged, they're even closing a bit, but they don't know how to scale because it's just them. And they're like, well, I've been doing it. And like I mentioned earlier, if you're the founder, like a lot of it is you just have that sheer will and you've got the historical knowledge of what you've built over the years and it makes it a bit easier for you. But without a process and an exact way to do everything in every step, if you go try and bring somebody else and say, hey, do the same, they're going to fall flat on their face. And I have so many founders come to me and say that they cannot get past themselves as the salesperson. It's a really big challenge. And so we really do work on that scale. Now, it's a bit more than just here's the process, go, because you're right. You said it's as long as you find the right person. That's not always easy. Hiring salespeople in many ways can be very, very difficult. I've had salespeople who were fantastic at other jobs and come to ours and it's a totally different deal and they fall on their face and it doesn't work out. Salespeople can be awesome at one spot and terrible at another. You might think of a sports player who was great at one team and bad on another team, same situation. And so there are certain ways that you can vet salespeople to see if they're the best. What I have heard is hire three, Fire two. Okay. That's kind of the mantra. Which is sounds harsh, yes. but it's, you know, that's kind of what some people do. So it's a testing process, huh. right? Oh, in the end, you never know. It's a put salt is a uh, sales is a very results driven exercise, right? There's only about the numbers and nothing else lies. It's, there's no gray area in this. So you can't hide no, you can't hide behind a wall so yeah high three five two i <laughs> love it brilliant is the biggest challenge matt for most people in this process then when they're like in that founder space separating themselves from the process because they're normally the face yeah it is for sure anthony that's a great point because they've gone through this and usually by the time they get to that point they're at least one or two years in you know they've been building this thing out they've been working on setting it up and getting the the first three pillars attract engage and close rocking so they're so used to being a part of it that one, it's hard for themselves personally to step out of it because they become very attached to it. But secondly, they don't know exactly how to take themselves out because a lot of their spiel and their scripting might be all about what they did to set everything up and bringing somebody else in new, new and fresh, it becomes a different situation, different story. So you're absolutely right, Anthony, it can be very difficult to pull themselves out of it. I think we've gone through a bit. Oh, of you learn as you go. And um, yeah, I think in our business yes same sort of thing so how do you separate yourself out of it that's always an interesting one it's probably the last piece that can fall <laughs> you can separate yourself out of but you do know the process and maybe some um some help from someone like yourself matt just to guide you through how to structure it in a way where it's not all about you and the sales process i got i got a point that you raised that's um an example for us is sharing the story about the podcast and how we put it together and how we come up with the idea and how we met some clients along the journey but it's not the same story if you bring someone else to talk about it. So it's, yeah, it's a fair point what you just said. Yeah. And one of the biggest challenges there, and this is why business is so hard, honestly, is there's definitely a perfect middle ground. Okay. And I mean, may not say perfect, maybe that's not the right way to put it, but there's the right way to do it is right in the middle because I've seen both ends of that spectrum. What I mean is this. So when a founder brings in somebody new to do their sales, they're going to take over sales for them. One of two bad things could happen. One is they think this is the salesperson, so they're going to be good. I hired an experienced salesperson and they don't put any of their oversight into it. And they just say, okay, go, you do it. And that salesperson goes off and maybe they don't have the right method or maybe they're not the right person. And they go off and do very poorly and it goes badly. There was not enough oversight. The other thing goes is the other way. The pendulum goes all the way to the other side is the founder is all over them, looking over their shoulder, making sure they're doing this and this, and they don't give them the opportunity to be able to stand on their own. And so essentially the founder is their crutch, meaning anytime that they have a question, anytime they have a challenge, they just go to the founder and the founder closes the deal. I was just talking to one last week where they said they can't get out of it because the sales team keeps bringing them in and asking them to do this and this. I said, do you do it every time? And he says, yes. I'm like, there you go. <laughs> That's why they so ask. You cannot be their crutch. <laughs> mm. 
I think it's a fair point. So how do you find that balance? Because that could be a challenge for a number of people because there is one or the other generally people will go down thinking you've hired someone and yep, they'll take it. Or how do you get the balance where you're not the crutch, but you're also not just letting them run on their own uh, devices? Well, there's the rub, isn't it? Like it's not, <laughs> it's definitely a challenge, it but be. if you have the right process, it's all about making sure you set the parameters, making sure that they're following the process, but then also giving them a bit of reins so that they can go off and run it themselves. And so there is definitely a fine line there and it's not easy. I'm not going to say it is, but that's definitely something we work on as our co coach and client relationship is making sure that they're getting that just right. Not brilliant, Matt. In terms of sales, mark and, and marketing, it is is clearly one of the most important things to any business. You can have the best product in the world if you don't know how to sell or market it. No one's going to find it, especially if you plug it online in the SaaS world. It's going to clearly get lost. You can sometimes have the not the greatest product in the world, but if you know how to market it and sell it, you can lead the lead the industry. Uh, we've all seen that before with different products mm -hmm. along the journey. So to summarize your experience in sales. If you were to go back to Matt that started out in that SaaS experience 15 years ago, what's a couple of things you'd mention to Matt to say, focus here, focus your attention here, because this will drive you forward at a quicker rate? That's a great question, Andrew. And actually, it's funny you bring that up because it's something that I did. So when I got out of my last SaaS system and decided to become a coach and help others do what I had done. I said that. I said, well, what, what do I even do? Like, how do I tell people and how do I design a program for these people? And I said, well, wait, you were these people. So why don't you just go back to thinking about yourself 15 years ago? And you know, you had some early struggle. So what would you tell yourself that would help you get past that initial roadblock and hurdles that you had to go through? And so I designed my SaaS founders program. I have a program specifically for software founders where they can learn all of these four pillars to scaling as well as the perfect deal process. And it makes it really easy. So I kind of package it up. I deliver this in such a way that it makes it something that they can consume very easily along with all the other things they have to do. So it doesn't overwhelm them, but makes it very simple and easy to be able to understand all four pillars, how they're going to build that out in their business and how they're going to use it to really scale to get exceptionally big. Brilliant. So you package it all up within the pillars and the perfect deal process. I won't dig into that today because I'd love to get you on again and dig into what that means to you in terms of the perfect deal process. If you're you're willing to jump on and share on another podcast in the future, so I think that would be good to dig in as well and get an understanding of that. Perfect. We'd be happy to. Yeah, it's it's definitely a fun thing that uh, revolutionized my world and got me into a place of extreme freedom because of what it can deliver sales wise mm -hmm. and what it's done for countless other companies that I've coached and consulted and made their lives much, much easier in terms of generating a lot more revenue and being able to grow their company. So happy to. Oh, fantastic, Matt. Now, tell us about how people can find out about you, your courses, your education, and some people in SaaS. That's definitely an area that we are speaking to and people listening today that might be struggling with sales and this sort of area. How do they reach out to you and get in contact? Sure. You can find me on LinkedIn, and I'll, I'll spell my name here in a second, but on LinkedIn, I'm constantly posting uh, tips and tricks and videos and little ways to help so that you can take that. And it's very actionable. You can plug it in. It helps you. But also you can learn a lot more on my website at mattwallach.com, M-A-T-T-W-O-L-A-C-H.com. And if you go there, I've got some things that you can download. I have a SaaS scorecard where if you download that, you'll actually be able to track all the key metrics that you should be tracking within your SaaS. And I have a free training that goes along with it. So it'll actually tell you how to improve each metric and what numbers you need to get to if you really want to start seeing the kind of scale that you might want to get to and if you want investors coming to you. So it's free. You can go download that off of my website and that way you can kind of start getting some good information going. Oh, brilliant, Matt. I will share that out when we share the post as well, point people in that direction. So really, I appreciate you taking the time to jump on the DevReady podcast and share all your uh, knowledge about sales in the space of SaaS. So thank you for your time. Absolutely, Andrew and Anthony. It's been great talking with you guys. Cheers, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Matt.